Executive Director for the Armenian National Committee Glendale Chapter and the Field Organizer for ANC Western Region. Uh, this weekend, uh, we all learned a little or a lot about grassroots advocacy, genocide recognition, public relations, elections, campaigns, community issues, and various other topics. But all those things are to be, in order to be effective, require two things, manpower and funding. The ANC is extremely, extremely fortunate to have countless volunteers that dedicate their time and effort into our cause. Uh, but one very, very important component of that is funding, which determines how far and wide you can reach to your constituents and how much power you actually hold within the political sphere. Yeah. Today's panel will introduce you to some new ideas and new concepts when it comes to fundraising. Uh, I'm very delighted to have Ann Ransford, who is our Glendale Community College Board of Trustees member. I've seen her work uh, throughout the last four or five years. Uh, she does a phenomenal presentation uh, every quarter for her interns. And I know that she has a lot of background with other nonprofit organizations in, in bringing fundraising ideas and new concepts to them. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Mara Chalian, who will be the moderator for this panel, uh, to take a vote from here. for being here on a Sunday morning, especially after last night and the past few days. It's been an amazing, amazing weekend, and, and um, I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm, and I'm honored to be with all the folks we've seen uh, this weekend. And one thing that, that I've been, I, I have, I've had a soundtrack in my head, and I'm not very musical, and, and, I, and I'm a little bit nervous to say this, <laughs> one of my panelists, but uh, one thing that has, that has uh, resonated with me throughout the theme that has resonated with me throughout this weekend is the song uh, Money, Money, Money. <laughs> and, and so from the first, <laughs> and I've been singing that in the back of my head throughout from our very first panel where we saw our artists who said we need resources to our advocates and lobbyists who said we need resources to every panel that I've been to. The ultimate thing is we need resources. And so let's talk about that. And so, in our community, as you know, we don't really like to talk about money or death. And we're going to talk about both today. So, good morning! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, last night, Nora Hosekian said that my motto is that length is leadership, and indeed, that's what I believe. And, um, and hopefully, that's what um, one of the messages that will come across today, because uh, we lead with our dollars as one way to lead, and that's a clear, defined way to do so. Um, in fundraising, we always talk about there's an art to it, and, uh, and there's a lot of intuition to it, and, and our panelists will speak to that. There's also a science to it, and, and, I, and I want to talk a little bit about that uh, so that, we, that provides some framework where we build upon and tap into our intuition. Uh, I'm in major gifts fundraising. My background is in international relief and development, and uh, I've worked in fundraising at, at public television, and in education, and now I'm at the hospital. And so I'm very proud of, 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 of all those institutions, and they're very successful, and they are successful because of fundraising and because of philanthropy. Uh, and so the science of it all in the field that I am in, which is major gifts fundraising, begins with qualification. What that is, is identification of your prospective donors. From qualification, you and that qualification stage is essentially cold calling, is one way to, 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 that we've all done, essentially. And then you move to uh, cultivation, and that cultivation stage is really building your relationship with your donors, and that can last anywhere from a week to 18 months. And so you need to give yourself breathing room to do that. From cultivation, then you move to the powerhouse of the ask, solicitation. And that's where you actually make the ask. And then from there, not to forget the most important part, almost, is stewardship at the very end. 
and that is when you steward your donors and bring them back to cultivation to make the next ask, to make to, to cultivate, to steward again. So that's that's my little scientific picture of my world, and um, and so with that. Um, With that, let's speak more about that if you're interested, but more so the, the other uh, experts on our panel have their perspective as well in fundraising. Uh, before we begin and before I introduce our, our next panelist, we'd like to, to take a quick survey of the room to see how many of you are students, to see what our fundraising experience is in the room, essentially. And so how many of you are students? Wonderful. And uh, how many of you are board members of any nonprofit? Any nonprofit? And uh, volunteers? I expect almost every hand up for this one, right? <laughs> and, um, and how many of you have ever asked somebody for money? <laughs> awesome. Wow. It's easy, right? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, after our panel, so. The, so after our panelists present today, we'll take your questions, and uh, and so now with that, I'll introduce our first panelist, um, Andrew Kazirian. Andrew is the chairman of the Armenian National Committee of America's Western Region, and um, and I I can't sing the praises of his organization or his team enough this weekend. Uh, prior to his appointment as chairman, he served as executive director of the Western Region Office. Andrew holds degrees from Columbia University, MIA in International Finance, Villanova with a JD in Law, and University of Pennsylvania with a BA in International Relations. He works in law, finance, and public policy. Andrew also studies ethnomusicology and tours internationally with his band Visa, a popular uh, rock fusion project. And so, Andrew, welcome. Thank you, Milo. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm really honored to be on this panel. I mean, I know you mentioned that I'm an expert, but uh, what I've done in my, in my time is to try and learn how to get to that level. So I'm very, very deeply honored to have you guys on this panel. I'm really interested. The rest of the weekend, <coughs> excuse me, the rest of the weekend was more of the interesting discussions about uh, the Armenian cause, <coughs> working on genocide recognition, things of that nature. This talk is going to be, uh, to me it's exciting because I want to hear from everyone in the room after our brief remarks, but this is the tougher, uh, the more difficult part of doing our work, which is, as, as Mon also aptly mentioned, trying to get the dollars. Um, <coughs> and in my time working in the organization, I've learned from some of the people in this room, like uh, Rafi and Adam and others. Um, like Model mentioned, making the ask is really tough. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult part uh, of fundraising. It is an art. There, are, there is science to that as well. Um, but trying to take those strategies and, and incorporate it into what we do with high touch can be a challenge. And uh, basically what I'd like to do is give you a brief, uh, a very brief overview. <coughs> a brief overview of what our organization does the needs that we have, uh, the types of projects that we pursue, the staff that we have, um, and outline that for you to give you a really brief understanding and kind of like a 100,000 foot view of what it takes to run the ANCA Western Region on a day-to-day -day, uh, day -day basis. Staff. Uh, currently in our office, we have three staff, and uh, they basically oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the ANCA Western Region, whether it's meeting with public officials, uh, organizing events, uh, working with our community <coughs> leaders, for example, Elena Sotchan, who just uh, did the introduction to the panel, she works as a field organizer. Uh, we have William Vidamian, I believe I saw him in this room, you can put your hand up. Uh, he's our executive director. Uh, the man works 24-7 uh, on, on issues that matter to High Tide, and I think High Brooks said, yeah, I saw him running around. He's also a dedicated member of our team that works nonstop as well. So uh, these are living, breathing people with a pulse. Um, they have salaries, they have their work as well, so they're part of the team. Uh, so there's a cost to that. That's one. Internships. Um, we've kind of underscored this throughout the weekend. Uh, one of the main goals we have is to try and train our young leaders of tomorrow. Without their participation, their growth, their, uh, their prospering, 
uh, we lose the next generation. So that's a huge priority for us. That's a cost. We do internships in Los Angeles. We do internships in Washington. There's an expense there. Uh, sponsorships for events. This weekend is a huge example of that. Uh, we just had a, a major banquet last night, and for the first time ever, we did a conference like this this weekend, which, as Nora is sitting there in the corner, she was a huge part of that as our board member. Um, but there's a huge cost for that as well. Renting the hotel, the banquet, the, the food, bringing the speakers in, flying them all in. These are all things that we have to do for those costs. Uh, and then finally, I'd say community programs. We have voter registration drives, lectures, just something that we organize for the community to keep everyone aware of things that ICOT is doing. There's a cost there as well. And what are some of the challenges? Obviously, since 2008, the economy uh, suffered a huge nosedive. So that has changed the landscape in which we make our fundraising asks. Things are much different now. Uh, trying to make an ask, you may get one-tenth or one-half or some kind of fraction of what you may have gotten before, before 2008, because of the economic difficulties that we deal with. And then you go to the other side of that, where you're competing with other organizations, Armenian or not. Uh, so you're competing in the marketplace. Uh, the economy has changed how donors give. It's also changed attitudes about how to give money. Uh, we've seen, actually, the uh, most recent example I can think on a mass scale was the Obama campaign. He, his campaign was very successful because of micro donations. He was able to reach out to people in so many different areas because they had a successful online grassroots effort. And obviously, I mean, I'm not comparing us to the Obama campaign, but <clears throat> the concept is there. And that is one of uh, having a concise, strong message that resonates with folks generally, universally. And that created this like, a machine, a tidal wave of micro donation. Um, so that's something that we've also explored as well, and I'll get to that uh, in a bit as well. <clears throat> Customs. We have a customary way of fundraising, and times are changing. So I'd say that pretty much for our organization over time, <clears throat> for better or for worse, it's become institutionalized to have one major banquet every year. And this has its positives and its negatives. Uh, as we saw last night, it was an extraordinarily energized, positive room. It was very successful. Um, but leading up to that for the entire year, planning for one event creates a huge risk on the organization because most of our budget is based on that event being successful every year. Uh, and thanks to dedicated staff, volunteers, uh, that does happen almost every year. But for example, let's say one year for an unforeseen circumstance, something goes wrong. Uh, in, in the world or in the community, and for, for whatever reason, the banquet is not there for us. That is a, a hugely catastrophic financial possibility. Uh, so that's something that needs to be calculated into how we run our organization. Um, other customary fundraising opportunities we've had, mailers. For example, when I was in the office, I was the executive director every three or four months. We would do a cold mailer to our ANC lists. And uh, actually, Adam, I believe you guys have metrics on average donors based on those mailers. What is it, about $100? Exactly, right? So basically, from those mailers going out, there would be an average donation, if you break it down, to about $100 per person. And that's based on a list of about 10,000 people. So as you can see, the percentages are what they are, and they're not very high. Um, and then also, I'll mention cold calling. Uh, I've done it myself. Uh, cold calling uh, it can be a, a tough experience because you're literally reaching out to folks. You're making a pitch. I mean, how many people in here have done sales? Okay. Well, a lot of the same skills and attributes that you incorporate in sales as a profession are what you use in fundraising, being personable, developing relationships, making a pitch, making that ask. And that can be a really tough thing to do. Um, but I say moving to the relationship part of that, that's where fundraising can actually start to have legs and it can start to be something that can have an opportunity for growth and success. Because, uh, and I think Mata would probably have some uh, better idea about this too, but usually that first meeting is not going to end up with the, the ask being successful. It can take two, three, four, five, up to ten times meeting with a potential donor to help find that right, uh, that right angle that will help them understand what you're doing, uh, how it's valuable to the community, and to make them feel like they should give. Uh, and how they can really feel like they're a part of the team. Um, I'd say, uh, coming back to the risks, not to harp on that too much, but uh, aside from the risk that's associated with having one major event, 
there's the opportunity cost, and a few people spoke to me about this last night to really underscore this. Um, although fundraising is very important, it also takes out four or five months. It, it eats up a huge chunk of our staff's time. So for four or five months of the year when, when uh, we are preparing for this major banquet, things can fall through the cracks on the political level. Meetings with officials, uh, managing that really important day-to-day, -day, like the nuance of the relationships you have with elected officials, those things matter and they add up. For example, if there's legislation coming up and you need to make those phone calls, you need to go to those meetings, you need to be around. In politics, 90% of the game is being there, being present, being on the phones. But if staff and everyone is working on fundraising because they're so worried about the budget, there's an opportunity cost there. So there, there are a lot of different things that we need to explore as an organization, uh, whether it's uh, developing new professionalized uh, committees or subcommittees of the organization that are dedicated to fundraising, uh, moving in the direction of social media donations or micro donations, uh, stepping up our, our relationship building and being more effective and more efficient, selling our uh, our brand name better, and actually that was what was very encouraging about this weekend. And, uh, I have Steve Martini on the fact that it's on the board. Um, he did an absolutely phenomenal job. As you've seen outside, the placards, uh, and it, it's just amazing. That, that kind of gives the organization a visibility and branding that is really important to achieving these kinds of goals. So we've already started moving in that direction, and that's something that needs to be developed more. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks very brief because I'd like to also hear from Anne, and what I'd really like to hear from uh, is the audience. And I'm very inspired that we actually have a great crowd here on a Sunday morning, so uh, I give everyone here a lot of credit. I'm lo really looking forward to hearing from you uh, and also answering your questions as much as I can. So thank you very much. And our next panelist, Anne Lansford. Anne and I have met several times in, prior to this uh, conference, and uh, I've been impressed with her leadership and her passion for the causes she cares about, um, and that you'll see why she's successful. So I'll read, I'll read her a little bit about her. Anne credits attendance at Oakland City College with her success. And she went on to earn a BS from San Jose State University and an MA from Pacific Oaks College. She is a trustee of Glendale Community College currently, uh, which is an elected position. And uh, she, her, her career includes 36 years of service at Glendale Community College in a variety of positions from instructor to administrator. This has given her the opportunity to understand the unique challenges and issues that face the college. She will bring a fresh perspective with her long-range planning experience and demonstrated visionary and enthusiastic leadership skills. She's been an active participant in the Greater Glendale community as a member of the executive board of the YMCA, the YWCA, the Glendale Chamber of Commerce, the Glendale Rotary, Temple Sinai, the Glendale Rose Float Association, the Glendale Association for the Retarded, Glendale Community College, Glendale, Greater Glendale Committee on Aging, Career Encores, and Life Services. And so, she, I can go on, she fulfilled a, life, you know, a lifetime dream of a six-year term, including the chair of the Glendale City Parks, Rec, and Community Services Commission. And Anne uh, was honored in 2007 with the Citizen of the Year Award from the Glendale Association of Realtors. So please help me welcome Anne Ransom. <laughs> Well, welcome all, and it's so nice to be able to share this lovely morning with all of you. Um, I'm going to talk about more practical aspects of fundraising, and uh, there are probably things many of you uh, that think of for all the hands that went up of those of you that have done fundraising. Uh, there are probably things that you all know, and so maybe along the way I'll give you some little gem that maybe you is, haven't thought about or renew what you're already thinking about. And so what I want to do is um, talk about these things. I want to talk about the importance of knowing your facts and being well informed about your uh, organization, about some fundraising tactics, 
And I want to tell you a story about a fundraising adventure that I had, and along the way, point out some of the fundraising tactics that I used. And my story is about a million dollar gift that we got at Glendale Community College to name a building. And um, I actually I was hoping we'd all have a picture of it, but this is the picture of the building here that uh, our gentleman gave us a million dollars for. A few caveats before I start that I wanted to mention. Um, is, you know, fundraising, as we've already mentioned, Andrew mentioned this, is mostly sales and marketing. And you, you raised, so many of you raised your hands to show that you actually have lots of experience in this area. But I want to mention also, even if you don't have professional experience in this area, you all have marketing and sales experience in selling your ideas to your parents, to your kids, to your spouse, trying to get what you want. And that's one of the reasons I feel like I was successful at fundraising. I always say I started when I was two years old trying to get what I wanted. And so if you're good at getting what you want, that's one of the most important keys, I think, in, uh, it, because it shows your enthusiasm and your excitement for what you're doing. And um, one of the really important skills, I think, as a fundraiser is learning to how to listen. And, and so often we, um, we're so in, engrossed in our own stories that we forget that we're there to listen to what the other person has to say. I, I can't emphasize that, that, that skill enough. And it, if it's not something that's in, that you normally think about in your, in your, you know, in your uh, fun life, you know, you're busy talking to other people, you, in your professional life in that way, you really need to get it in your head and say to yourself, okay, stop, listen to what they have, when you hear yourself talking, stop and say, ask the person a question so you get them involved. That's a really key factor because people are very attracted to people that listen to them. Um, and then another part of fundraising I think that, that people forget, it's really such a pleasure and a privilege to help somebody get what they want. It's really privileged work. And nothing is more rewarding than working with someone as they make a gift. Because we're always at our highest um, uh, value as an individual when we're giving. And to share that with someone, I can't tell you what a wonderful privilege that is. So let's begin. OK, so we want to talk about knowing your facts. I have a little outline here. Some of you want to jot it down, you probably know. I was hoping you'd have a handout, but, but we weren't able to do that. But obviously, the, the, these are the facts that I always like to do when I'm going to do a fundraising project, is to put these down on a sheet of paper. And it might be something that you'll end up handing to a donor. It might be the basis for some kind of literature you're going to put together, but it clearly is the basis for having things in your head about what's important. Obviously, the name of the organization, the contact person, the project name, what is the pro why is the project important, um, amount that you're asking for, total amount for the project if it's part of a bigger, you know, a project and you're just asking for a piece of the budget, but people always want to know. You know, what's the total budget, what's your timeline, and what is your budget, and what other pertinent information that you might have that you want to share with your donor. Okay, so let's begin. So here's my story, but it's much abbreviated because it did happen a few years ago. I'm sitting in my office, and the telephone rings, and it's a board member who says to me, I have a friend that I think wants to give a big gift to Glendale College. I think it's a million dollars. Now, this fundraising tactic number one, if you don't remember anything else I say this entire piece, keep in mind that board members, this is a classic fundraising experience. Board members, you're out there, you're the eyes and ears of the organization. You're the one that can identify these people. Look at this number of people here, multiply that by all the people that you know, and that is really important. You hear, you talk to someone at a cocktail party or at a sporting event or wherever and it's, it shows an interest in the organization, you want to be sure and follow up, follow up, follow up another fundraising technique. Okay, so what did we do next? We invited the um, donor to lunch and um, 
Another fundraising tactic is that people who give to an organization always want to meet with the highest leadership they can. Now obviously if you're selling tickets or something, I'm not talking about that, but for a, a big donation. I, at Barnell College, was the director of the foundation, but I was a conduit to our president superintendent. People want to always get to the highest level and meet that person. So we planned a lunch and we met with um, our, our donor. We got acquainted and since I already knew he was interested in a gift, this is where my ask was, I prepared a, a presentation, which I had already prepared actually, so one of my important points I think is another tactic is have your ducks lined up, know what you want. Someone told me one time you should always have a proposal in your pocket somewhere so the person that comes along that's going to meet that need, you can hand it to them. So anyway, I had, I had actually talked to someone else and it was a goal of mine to try to, to fund this building. So I had a fairly decent put together proposal with some photos and so forth. And it was, it was before we actually had broken ground on the building. So uh, it was all the planning kinds of things. And um, so I handed that to him. So that's fundraising, identifying your target audience, have your decks lined up, as I just mentioned, and developing some kind of literature. And I use, as I say, just literature, a piece of paper with just this information, a fact sheet, I call it, that you can give to someone. It doesn't have to be a fancy, fancy brochure. And we raise money for a, a donor wall with, um, you know, a piece of paper that we did on in the old days on the mimeograph machine. Anybody remember those? <laughs> You know, it wasn't anything that fancy. Um, so I didn't hear from the gentleman for a while, the donor. But what I did was to try to get him involved at the college, we invited him to be a member of our bond oversight committee. We had, uh, several years before, passed a um, bond for this in, in the city for our college. And part of the re law requirement is that you have an oversight committee. Well, this gave him a chance to see what some of our capital needs were. And in those, that was in the early 2000s when everything was going out of sight, the cost of cement and the cost of construction. So even though we had a budget for this building, everything was going up, up, up. And so this gave him a chance to get involved. Again, fundraising tactic, get your, get your donor involved in your organization and follow up, follow up, follow up. That's another one that I, I always say, you know, when we talk about computers, we go back up, back up, back up when you're talking with fundraising, follow up, follow up, follow up. So several months later, I got a call from the donor and he asked me to come to his office and um, I of course immediately did make time again, fundraising tactics, somebody calls you like that, make time immediately to do what they ask you to do. And um, I went to his office and came in and he said to me, he says, well, I've decided that I'm going to give the college a million dollar gift. And what he had just built a series of condominiums down in Newport Beach, and he was going to give us one of the condominiums that was on the market for a million dollars. So fundraising tactic, don't fall on the floor when somebody <laughs> tells you that. But it was really hard not to. So, um, you know, try to stay calm. But on the other hand, you want to show your enthusiasm and, and be very thankful and very excited because that helps somebody feel good too. But it, it was quite an exciting experience. So I left his office, called the president of the college, and I said he's going to give us a million dollars and we're supposed to work with this attorney, and which we did. And as soon as I got back to the office, the fundraising tactic, thank you, thank you, thank you. I sent a thank you and the president sent a thank you to him immediately so that we, again, let him know how appreciative we were. Well, along the way, we had some bumps, you know, there were some things he wanted and we had to negotiate with the attorney, and we almost lost the gift at one point uh, because of some of the demands that, that some of our trustees, I wasn't on a trustee at that point, but one of our trustees was making, and, but our president was able to make it all work and we ended up with a good experience, but again, another fundraising tactic, be flexible, Remember, it's sales and marketing, and um, you know that's really important to not just be, you know, this is kind of the way it has to be. That you, you're willing to do some dance with the donor, you know, and so he can get or she can get what they want. What they want. 
Well, and then the thank yous. Um, we devised, I devised a number of ways to say thank you. And one of the things I think about the thank yous is the more creative and interesting you can be with your thank yous, I think you stand out a little bit above everyone else. And uh, one of the things that we did was I had people all over campus write little notes on three by five cards, put them in a ring, and gave it to them as a gift. And so we had you know, something from everybody on our whole camp campus, the administrators, the teachers, the faculty, the classified staff. And so it's something kind of a little special. And we did lots to thank him. He and his wife, we gave honorary degrees at, at the college. We involved him in a lot of activities on campus. To the point that his daughter one time said to me, enough already, you thanked us enough, <laughs> you know. And we, we, we got it, we appreciate it. Well, this donor it went on to help us uh, furthermore with this building. We, we put in the front of it, uh, a, oh, there's my picture here. Probably oh, can't speak too well, but anyway, this was a donor wall, and it was called the Thank You America Wall because our donor was from India and came here to go to school. In, um, in the United States, uh, went to school in Utah, came to LA with $25 in his pocket, and has been obviously very successful, and obviously has lots of successful friends. So we have this beautiful wall, and we raised another $400,000 from his friends for that wall. So again, you know, your donors can help you do more and more and more for your organization. So one of my other messages, fundraising tactics here, is don't be afraid to ask. You know, by asking somebody, you really are giving them the opportunity to do good and feel good. And so often we're a little bit intimidated about asking, but asking is really giving another person a, a, a privilege. And, you know, getting that around in our heads instead of going, oh my gosh, you've got to ask this person for something. To think of it as how you're helping that other person do uh, what they want to do. So I want to, in conclusion, I want to say that um, this was a major gift, but all gifts are major gifts, and all donors are important, just as we talked about the Obama campaign. And you're going to have your own advent adventures. I just hope that I've given you a few little tactics along the way that might be helpful to you, but you're all going to have your own adventures, and they're going to be all, all in different areas. and. Um, don't be uh, thinking that every day, you know, I mean, once in my, once in my career I had a million dollar gift and, and it was a great privilege. And, you know, the other thing is that donors become your great friends. Um, Mr. Bupesh and I have continued to be good friends. We have lunch uh, fairly regularly. When I um, retired and I went to lunch with him and I said, he said to me, what are you going to do now? And I said, well, I'm sort of thinking about running for trustee and he goes, I'll give you a thousand dollars. I didn't even have to ask, <laughs> which is the beauty when you get get it going. And so, anyway, much much um, excitement and enthusiasm you should bring to your asks, and um, I wish you much successful time with your asks too. Thank you. Thank you, Anne.